for that. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is something that uh, um, starting from uh, October, mid of October uh, last year, and to uh, early November, and about two weeks before SC19, the ICM um, led by uh, our American, our German here, and also the uh, Singapore three star competition so first of all, I'd like to uh, use this uh, to set the contest. Moving data at the speed and scale is something that uh, can be very well um, illustrated using a water transport analogy. And if you have been uh, California, then uh, you, especially Northern California, you probably uh, have heard about this uh, Hachi Hachi Aqueduct project which is a major engineering project in the Bay Area uh, in the early, late 19th, started late 19th uh, century to early 20th century. So it provided water, and uh, still provides water from the Hachi Hachi Reservoir uh, in Yosemite area to the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's a, a illustration of the aqueduct. So it crossed the Sierra Mountains and then it comes from the water is drawn from the, the uh, Yosemite Hachi Hachi Reservoir and it feeds into a Crystal Lake a Spring Reservoir and then the water is distributed to the Bay Area. Now, for this uh, major water transport project, what are the four major elements to make it working and successful? And this question, I will answer it since uh, we are tight on time. The first thing is you have to have a reservoir with sufficient water level. This is no joke. And because um, California suffered several years drought uh, almost to the, uh, the uh, to the extent that the water is gonna be rationed and in certain area it was rationed. So without, then the next element is a array of pumps. And remember I said pumps, that's plural because for redundancy for the high volume, you really need a, a powerful, uh, many powerful pumps at each end. Certainly you need the electricity to power them. And of course you need a large pipes, again, plural, because for redundancy and for the volume, okay? Now for uh, moving data at a scale and speed, the uh, requirements are almost exactly the same. First of all, you need to have high enough storage throughput to fill the rest of the data pass. Secondly, you need to have a, a digital data pump, okay, the counterpart of the physical pumps at EN. Then you have to have enough computing power to drive the application, that is like electricity, drive the pumps. And finally, you have to have the high-speed connection Right now, for in most places, 100G is still common, although 200Gs, even 400Gs are already emerging. What's important to keep in mind is that uh, the moving data at speed and scale is neither a network alone nor a software alone endeavor. It's actually an infrastructure endeavor. So you need to get your storage ready first and your computing first, ready first, and then your network check out first, qualify, qualify first, before you start thinking about the software. So in a DOE terminology, and we have to be working uh, uh, on a access scale computing related project, uh, supporting its data transfer requirement. So we happen to know the DOE, uh, like a, a fast forward project and concepts pretty well. The co-design basically is an integrated consideration of storage, computing, networking, and the concurrency of the application in order to have an overall highly performant system. Now, given that, let's move on. So first of all, I'd like to talk about why uh, this thing uh, was motivated. And when I met Merrick, at the uh, ISC uh, 2019 in Frankfurt and uh, Germany, he mentioned this uh, uh, endeavor, possibility of doing this endeavor to me. Uh, I was quickly persuaded to join him because it's really meaningful. I know the situation before many years between Europol and, uh, 
sorry. Between Europe and uh, uh, Asia, they if you want to move data, let's say from here, you have to move across the Atlantic and cross the United States, cross the Pacific. It's just a very, very long distance, okay? And then because back then, let me see why the thing is jumping. Uh, because for many years between the Europe and the Singapore, the seemingly shorter pass is only a 10 G link. That's not really sufficient for today's high speed transfer requirement. And so when in August uh, 2019, a new link um, operated and owned by six different operators, Arnet of Australia, uh, Guillaume and of uh, um, the Europol and Nordnet, the uh, Signran and the Surfnet and Ting, they uh, became operational. That's the CAE one. Now you say this, this one looks shorter. You say, gee, that should be working better, right? Actually, not really. Let me show you why. Now this is a a, a slide from my. Uh, uh, former co-PI at the Slack National Laboratory at, in Menlo Park, California. You see, different international connections actually, a, uh, each one has an alpha value associated with it. Have you noticed? Even crossing the Pacific, okay, the alpha values tend to be above 0.7. But in the Mediterranean area and Red Sea area, Indian Ocean area, the alpha value tend to be very low. Why? We don't have time to get in this. I would encourage you to uh, check out uh, his uh, uh, talk giving a Samsung forum, okay? And he's Dr. Les Cottrell is my co-PI. And basically, the, uh, the, the lower the alpha, the more difficult to uh, have a high quality transmission. Now, look at the previous slide. See this? This is a CA1 pass through the low alpha area. So, Will it work well? We will have to see, right? This is the reason why, just because you have a connection, you cannot say, gee, it must be working well. No, not really. You have to test it out. Especially the CA one also uh, um, is operated by uh, uh, six operators and the, the fair use policy is very stringent. So let me uh, next talk about the, um, the, the setup. The, the setup on both sides, on the Singapore side, it's a really a production side, uh, ready setup. It uses not just one Luster file systems, it uses actually two. And each one has a 20 so-called OSTs and each, o that's in plain English, that's just a storage servers, okay? Each one uh, has a four SATA um, spinning disks. So they are connected to a single, um, Data transfer server. It's a super micro server. The model is listed here and using a so uh, FDR uh, inter infinite band interface uh, rated theoretically 56 GPPS, so two times now. It's close to 112 theoretical GPPS. On the Singapore side, it's just a single one U with the eight NVMe SSDs. Uh, there's a very unusual. Uh, about this endeavor because if you look at this now this CAE one uh, started from London connected to uh, Singapore and so when we and of course uh, from Poland you have to go through the Gian net okay the Europe one and the, to connect to uh, London and go over here but where even though from Poland to London is has a 100G connection for quite some time how about the other side because because of the, the operators, the naturally there were two choices, right? One is in Singapore, one is in Australia. But then who would be ready by then, in a, say before SC19, be ready to uh, 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 collaborate with this endeavor? And so luckily, uh, Singapore came out first and about just uh, slightly more than uh, two weeks before the end of October, they said they were ready. So we only had like uh, two weeks to prepare for this. And we have to do many, many things as I will uh, talk about in the following slides. So there, just because of this, 
So the uh, we wanted to achieve, of course, higher than the FD, the, the 56 GPPS. And then uh, also uh, un living under the bandwidth constraint by, in, by the operator, that's the 80 GPPS. So how are we going to ensure all are well? See, so this slide shows you the, uh, the full path from the ICM to uh, Singapore A star CRC or L. And then, then, but this one is very interesting. And this is, shows the undersea cable system yeah, from uh, uh, Mediterranean, okay, our way to Rasi, Indian Ocean, and to Singapore. This is this is the this undersea system actually once became a 100G uh, connection, and you can see the social impact is really great because it allows regions and countries along this path to have a 100G uh, digital on ramp, okay, to the rest of the world. Before they didn't, now they do. But given the low alpha value and the other practical reasons, somebody has to come up first and do the test and show, yes, this connection really can be used for production level, moving data at speed and scale. And that's what this endeavor was trying to do. And now I'm gonna show you some uh, results. So remember early on, I said that uh, the, the six operators took all together impose a very stringent uh, fair use policy. So uh, we notified all the operators and they agreed to let us use it, but we only uh, had like 80 GPPS uh, maximum bandwidth. Now it's one thing uh, you have a network connection it's another thing you have available bandwidth. So how do you know the they really allocated uh, 80 GPPS? How can you assure that's available? So how can you qualify it basically? Now the the sig the Merrick's team, um, uh, networking team led by Jaroslo. Okay, he will be a speaker next one, um, and. Uh, uh, Ken of uh, uh, Singapore CR, A star CRC, they together they did uh, the qualification test using a simple tool called IPER3. Okay, and by firing up six pairs between the two endpoints, and then and they were able to achieve uh, on average about 72 GBPS. That's close to 80 GBPS. So we knew the allocated bandwidth was available. And notice that by using IPER3 over such a long distance, that's 12,373 miles, okay? And this is a, just a planned TCP. IPER3 is not a, a sophisticated part of your tool, a data movement tool. It's just a do a, doing a memory test. And so even with this basic tool, using modern TCP, by using highly in high enough concurrency, multiple instances of IPER3 and with and turning on the threading uh, uh, mode of each instance, you could achieve relatively smooth 72 GPPS on the average. So that's two facts one needs to keep in mind. Modern TCP is sufficient for moving data at the speed and scale over long distance. And then, uh, Two is the concurrency of the software is very critical. Let me move move on. So not only uh, the once the the um, the network available bandwidth was qualified using IPERF3, then we of course we need to qualify it with our own application, and then that's our uh, software called Zata ZX, and ours of course is a. a special purpose um, data mover and that designed for moving data at the speed scale. So it, it could also do a memory to memory a transfer for many things, including uh, assuring the available bandwidth. The threading model obviously is far more sophisticated than the IPER threads. So with that using memory to memory, we achieved, you can see more than 70 GPPS 72 GPPS and very flat and smooth. This again shows you the importance of concurrency, uh, uh, high concurrency of a software is so important. Next, now memory and to memory test is really just preliminary. To do it real, you need to do a, a storage to storage. So how do we do that? Now, first of all, now, 
they are two um, last file system. How can you uh, use use them together? And that's one thing. But before you can use them together, you need to assure each one it has a sufficient super to contribute. Now, here is one thing. Remember the pa parallel file system, the parallel it really implies you need to use them in a parallel ways, okay? That's what they are, you can see in this uh, web UI. Um, there are many multiple tasks, that's parallel tasks. They were uh, tra doing transfers uh, to get at the same time. And with this, each um, last file system was able to contribute about 40 GPPS, okay? And that's remembered. There's no uh, flash to, uh, uh, flash arrays. There's no NVMe drives. It's just pretty uh, standard uh, 72 RP, uh, 100 RPM uh, SATA drives, okay? And this is uh, pretty good, actually. Now comes to the real test. How can you use the two um, last file uh, together? So, well, actually, the, the that depends on the data mover software's ability to aggregate the provided the storage. Okay, so then with that, actually, again, you can see we use multiple transfer tasks, and we were able to the software were able to utilize the two um, last file system together. Remember, IB or InfiniBand, unlike Ethernet, IB adapters cannot be bounded. So it, it's up to the uh, application, in this case, the data mover software to aggregate the, the, the throughput of the two file system. So it's more or less around 60 GPPS, okay? That's a pretty good for over uh, 12,373 uh, miles. And over a possibly a very, uh, it's a low alpha value area. And yes, indeed, um, getting this um, uh, transfer um, endeavor to go at this rate, it's more difficult per hour experience than going from uh, Singapore to Los Angeles than our way to Chicago. That's much longer transfer um, distance. The latency is 233 milliseconds. This is only 176 milliseconds, if I recall correctly. Now, I uh, like to talk about why, uh, another reason why we are doing this, because this is a real data transport uh, uh, trial, okay? They are actually, in modern times, there are three uh, types of uh, data uh, movement solutions. The first one is data access solutions. And pretty much, it's a more end-user oriented. Data uh, uh, doesn't move, the, and each one is retrieved in small volumes. Then the next one is data transport solution. This is where uh, the code design becomes mandatory. It's also very important because modern uh, data is ma ma mostly machine generated. They must be batch oriented. Human beings are no longer the main source of a uh, data generation, okay? That has to be kept in mind. So modern data movers must be designed with this key in mind in mind, that is, you have to handle machine generated and uh, batch oriented, automation uh, uh, oriented uh, data movement, okay? And they are typically move, uh, moving at a scale too. So then the, the third one is where um, many people have a confusion about, it's a data aggregation solution. And so pretty much it's a, it's a network, uh, oriented operation, uh, software design one, okay? Independent data traffic are routed uh, over uh, a one or more um, predefined connections in order to keep their utilization high. So uh, that's the key, independent data flow aggregated, okay? So this is a pretty proven technique used by Comcast and Google in 2013 uh, to achieve over, say for Comcast in 2013, between New York and, the Chica and, and Chicago using uh, 15 um, 100 G connections to uh, handle about 1.4 terabits per second. That's 2013. And Google also has its B3 in order to keep its uh, uh, data center uh, connections 
utilization higher than 90% of the time. ES9 in 2016 uh, moved from uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, Oakland to Berkeley. And so in order to uh, move the data, they established uh, two times 200 GPPS connections called uh, Bay Express, okay? And so these are uh, very um, established example. Most high-speed uh, demonstration or demos at the ISC or SC conferences are of this type. Uh, data transport, no, not really, okay? Hold on. So this is the most dominant and most challenging, and it's difficult to do well because you have to uh, really make sure you understand the co-design principle and apply them. And this is um, something that uh, many parties, even today, okay, uh, do not do. And that's why they cannot get uh, like a, a high enough or uh, or high, high highly efficient uh, transfer. They, but that's, uh, let's keep going. Now, today, and this endeavor is also the uh, we did uh, it is just the first stage of a uh, uh, possibly a uh, uh, future endeavors uh, as well. It's because nowadays in the data intensive institutions often use uh, uh, so called public clouds. Okay, and this is uh, especially we deal with uh, enterprises, uh, commercial uh, customers. We see this kind of a situation everywhere. So you have on-prem, even uh, um, on-prem object storage, on-prem file storage, and uh, you in the cloud, you have um, also file storage. You even use the public cloud. So you really have to make sure that, uh, that all the data paths are enabled. You should be able to move data from file to, to, to object, object to file, and, uh, and between them, among them, uh, on-prem and off-prem or to the public cloud and even public to cloud to public cloud, okay? For this doesn't even cover the whole situation. For instance, in energy industry, they have to be able to retrieve data from Arctic region, from tropical forest, from undersea seismic sensors, say in the Gulf of Mexico. This data movement is absolutely not just a software alone or hardware alone. I mean, how can you install a, 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 a additional hardware, okay? Like a remote RDMA type of a device on already deployed undersea sensors. There's no way, okay? But just give you a flavor of the challenges in this kind of situation. So keep going. Then the next thing I'd like to bring to the audience attention is streaming is becoming more and more important. And in fact, the uh, Department of Energy of the United States Office of Science funded us to uh, do the streaming development because this thing is uh, being looked into by energy industry, by the life science industry, by the autonomous uh, vehicle or uh, connected vehicle and also smart cities, many, many industries are doing that. And for DOE, the major accelerators are looking to doing streaming simply because the store forward classical model doesn't work anymore. See, the, the local data uh, generated by an accelerator is so fast and so so high volume. Uh, store it locally and processing locally, that would be too expensive. So they have to be processed semi-real time by a remote supercomputing center, such as a nurse in Berkeley. Um, how do you do that? You have to do your streaming, okay? Uh, many other um, large nuclear uh, accelerators handled by uh, Office of Nuclear Physics have to be handled the same way. So finally, I'd like to uh, uh, and uh, give my acknowledgement, okay? Uh, it's a pleasure for us to work with the two uh, prestigious institutions. Their teams are really excellent. It's a, and first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Merrick, uh, Dr. Merrick McAwitz, uh, for uh, getting us in and involving this. And then his team, Machine and Jaroslaw, are two excellent technologists to work with. Okay, and then the Singapore um, A Star CRC team, of course, they're uh, very, very good. And the uh, Dr. Chen or Dominic, Dominic Chen and uh, Dr. Wu 
and Miss Tan and uh, uh, in her team, uh, Ken, the, the, the gentleman who performed the bandwidth, first stage bandwidth qualification, they are excellent as well. And in my, in my company, I'd like to thank you, my two founding members, Igor, I call him cheerful Igor. He's always in good mood. And uh, Alexander, okay, he's very fast. I call him the speedy Alex, okay? So uh, with that, any questions? I conclude my talk now. Thank you very much, Jing. That was, uh, that was uh, of course, for me, extremely satisfying to so describe our joint work. And then it, it, it's such a great pleasure working with you and learning Thank from you. you cause, uh, we ha we are learning uh, each day we're working on this project was was a great uh, learning experience so uh, i encourage people to uh, from our audience to ask and we, we will have time for just one question do we have any any questions from there so Chin, uh, maybe i will ask you how does it fit with the with the plans of uh, department of energy Yes, net, and how 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 can they uh, benefit from from the work that you have just presented? Uh sure, because um, even uh, uh, national labs are not looking into uh, streaming. In fact, uh, streaming has been done by other national labs, uh, such as uh, uh, I believe uh, um, uh, yeah, Jefferson Lab is has been looking into it, and uh, of course at the Slack and the the streaming is very necessary for lcs2 and the the high bandwidth transfer uh, is always um very desirable in fact esna is uh, the leading this uh, project called fabric which is a nsf funded project for a uh, uh, like a domestic united states nationwide uh, high speed network and uh, it, it, the backbone is uh, up to terabit level. At uh, this time, uh, at this type of uh, available bandwidth and the speed, and you have to have a, like a scale out architecture, and which is what we have, okay? And the high efficiency. So, be, the the only, the reason is because at each node on the fabric uh, network, I mean, you wouldn't be able to put up a huge amount of uh, hardware. It just uh, a node, it's just a cabinet, okay? So this software fits into that pretty well. So I look forward to uh, participate the initial testing of the Fabric project, which ES9 already verbally invited us to join. Very good, Jin. So I'm also looking forward to further explorations with you and then doing other tests. And uh, we, of course, discussed it at length uh, at various occasions. Thank you very much. Uh, we all thank you for, for this presentation.